is Sunday, uh, June the 21st. And uh, my name is Silvia Najivan. I'm Deputy Managing Director of the Institute for the Danube Region and Central Europe, IDM. And IDM is organizing this event together with the Political Academy and uh, the RENA Institute. It's a format, uh, panel discussions to uh, parliamentary elections in our focus region, which exists for several years. However, this time, due to uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic and necessary regulations, we started uh, this panel discussion as a live stream format, an online one, and I appreciate, uh, uh, first of all, to give the floor to Ambassador Klaus Wolfer, who is head of the Department of Southeast Europe and EU Enlargement and Deputy Political Director at uh, the Austrian Federal Ministry for in Europe, Integration and uh, Foreign Affairs. And a part of that, he's also a member of the IDM board in Vienna. So many thanks for joining us. Thank you, uh, Najivan. Uh, uh, hello to everybody. I hope you can hear me. Um, it was um, uh, quite um, an effort to get uh, connected, but I think this is a good omen. And if you can hear me now, uh, I'm uh, really deeply satisfied and we have already achieved something. So hello here from the Austrian Foreign Ministry in Vienna. Uh, thank you all uh, listening and watching for the interest in the subject. Uh, I'm really happy to be here uh, also on behalf of, as a, as a, of the IDM, Institut für Donauraum und Mitteleuropa, uh, who I think have chosen a very uh, pertinent subject at the right time. Now, one could argue that at uh, elections in Serbia, uh, what can be expected, we know who the winner will be, uh, it is uh, not a very exciting uh, thing. Uh, why should we uh, lose too much time and effort on it? But I think there are excellent reasons uh, to argue um, to the contrary. In fact, uh, it is uh, not only is Serbia uh, the biggest of the Western Balkan uh, countries, but also uh, the elections take place in a particular moment uh, where things are really to, um, to uh, get moving again after years of stagnation, maybe. Um, there are elections that are particular in many ways. As I mentioned, uh, there will be, um, we can already expect uh, the, the result by and large, but however, it will be important to gauge uh, the degree of abstention, given that the opposition, uh, or part of the opposition have called for the boycott of the elections. So that is a, a thing to watch. And like every election, it is a way to take the pulse of a nation, of a country. And for that reason, it is uh, particularly um, relevant in this moment where the belgrade pristina dialogue is about to um, hopefully take steam again. Uh, and, uh, European Union Special Envoy um, Milorad uh, Lajcak, he is currently in Pristina. He intends to be in Belgrade very soon. Uh, there is this invitation uh, by the uh, U.S. government, U.S. White House, uh, for leaders of the two countries, uh, Belgrade and Pristina, uh, to come to Washington to discuss things. So all this is uh, to be scheduled is scheduled within the next uh, what is it, ten days. Uh, so it is really um, a very um, exciting moment. There is 28th of June looming, the uh, famous um, day of uh, uh, St. Fight, as we say, Vidov uh, Dan, a date which is very heavily loaded in, in history and memories and expectations um, in, the, in the entire area in Southeast Europe and in, well, in Serbia in particular. So I think there is really a lot uh, to discuss and you, uh, there is a, a fine circle of uh, invitees uh, uh, here today. Uh, who are very well placed to, um, uh, to help us understand better uh, the whole situation. I understand it will be Dr. Najivan who will introduce the speakers, uh, whom I all hold in, in high esteem. And uh, I wish uh, this uh, conversation and this discussion success, enlightenment to us, and a tiny contribution to making things better in Southeast Europe. 
Thank you and uh, hello from Vienna. So many thanks, Ambassador Wolfer. Uh, before we enter uh, our panel discussion with our guests, I would like uh, to give some words on the current situation uh, in Serbia. Serbia is uh, the first country um, that um, is uh, now for, for ta taken for, for the parliamentary election. So after the COVID-19 pandemic and necessary regulations, uh, Serbia is now the first country where these uh, parliamentary elections will take place. Uh, and uh, it's also interesting uh, to see against the background of the election of 2016, uh, which parties might have a good chance uh, to enter the parliament. Uh, when we take a look at uh, the um, um, graphic of uh, the parliamentary elections of 2016, we can see that uh, the SNS headed by uh, in fact, Alexander Vucic, uh, the progressive party, is uh, the most prominent one. Uh, it's also expected that uh, it might also um, increase its share. And apart from uh, the SNS, also the uh, Socialist Party under Ilica Dacic has uh, good chances uh, to uh, enter uh, and, and to to increase uh, its mandate. Uh, and uh, also now for 2020, uh, the radical party, Serbian radical party, uh, might also play a role, a big role in uh, in these uh, in the results of uh, the 2020 elections. And when we take a look uh, at uh, the uh, 2016 uh, election results, we can see that we have an overestimating um, dominance of the SNS, and then uh, all other parties um, are here uh, to see and. Um, when we uh, go to uh, Ser Serbian uh, parliamentary elections at uh, the moment, um, we have a specific uh, situation, the pandemic 19, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, global, which is a global problem, global crisis. And uh, of course, Serbia, as many other states in Europe and abroad, uh, faced uh, a lockdown. And what is interesting about Serbia is the way the lockdown was declared and uh, realized because um, um, it uh, would be according uh, to the Serbian uh, constitutional framework, it would be adequate uh, to use the national protocol for the case of catastrophes such as earthquakes, uh, floods and uh, pandemic. But instead of that, uh, the state of emergency was declared and the state of emergency is only declared by constitutional law uh, when a state and danger exists, uh, such as uh, violent uprisings or war. And uh, in a way, uh, with this emergency state, uh, we have uh, another context uh, than uh, just using the national protocol for case of uh, catastrophes. And uh, these uh, regulations and uh, the situation of uh, the lockdown, which uh, started on March 15 and ended in May uh, the 6th, uh, also deepened uh, the already existing deep polarization among the Serbian society and uh, among the approximately 6.7 officially registered voters in Serbia. And in general, we could uh, see two main blocks uh, among uh, the Serbian voters. On the one hand, uh, the absolute supporters of uh, the government uh, headed by uh, the Prime Minister Anna Brnabic and influenced by the uh, Serbian President uh, Aleksandar Vucic. And on the other hand, uh, the uh, vicious critiques and opponents who, uh, first of all, criticize uh, the questionable implementation of the curfew and uh, the growing dissatisfaction uh, among the population, mostly also living in, in towns and uh, in fact uh, quarantined in, uh, in their flats. And uh, this deep division and polarization also revolves around the question of a possible election boycott uh, in a country where the average voter turnout in the last years was about already 53%. Uh, the last uh, election turnout 2016 was about uh, 56 And uh, despite many attempts uh, even by the European Union to moderate between the government and uh, the opposition. The boycott is uh, still uh, ongoing. And uh, interestingly, an interesting detail is also that uh, Donald Tusk uh, 
wish the Serbian president, Aleksandar Vucic, uh, good luck for the coming uh, parliamentary elections. But uh, not only the division among uh, uh, the government and the opposition uh, can be realized, also the opposition itself is deeply uh, divided. We have uh, also uh, 20 um, election uh, and, and coalition uh, parties coalitions and uh, main blocks uh, we could we could see at uh, first of all the alliance for serbia which was founded by uh, major opposition parties such as uh, the democratic party the party for freedom and justice the social democratic party and the people's party and even very uh, uh, so so hard uh, nationalistic uh, party and uh, they uh, share since uh, their foundation in 2018 a common goal namely the removal of uh, the current SNS government and uh, also uh, they're getting out of uh, the marginalized uh, public uh, position but uh, although they share this common goal they do not um, succeed in overcoming their political and uh, ideological differences and also um, their relations, uh, which is, of course, uh, according uh, to the different ideological uh, backgrounds, uh, antagonistic. And uh, the second uh, group uh, within uh, the opposition, influential group, is um, the um, Movement for Free Citizens, uh, which was founded uh, in the course of the citizens' protests in 2019. It is headed by the uh, well-known actor Sergei Trifunovic, who on the one hand criticizes the government, but also uh, the uh, parliamental uh, opposition. And uh, he, uh, as well as uh, other um, uh, parties, uh, such as the Alliance for Serbia, do boycott uh, the elections. So, and apart from this uh, elections boycott, we also have uh, a new um, um, removal, a new, a new uh, reform, uh, because uh, the Prime Minister Anna Brnovic uh, declared uh, that uh, the census from five to three uh, percent for entering the parliament uh, will be uh, decreased. So, from five percent to three percent, with the explanation that also small. Uh, parties should uh, have the chance to, to enter the parliament and, and um, be uh, influential. And as we see, we have uh, the election boycott. We have uh, a new um, political uh, legal reform in Serbia, uh, which leads us to a situation where we, in fact, uh, cannot estimate, uh, really estimate uh, the um, results, the, the coming uh, election results. and. Uh, this uh, is great for discussing today, and I would just like to give you a short uh, um, overview of the uh, parties, uh, which are the candidates. Uh, we have all in all, we have uh, 20 parties uh, for, um, for the elections, and uh, then uh, we have here uh, those parties who do boycott uh, the uh, parliamentary elections to hinder to hinder uh, the results. And of course, uh, this is uh, a further element uh, just to, um, to polarize uh, the political discourse and the political debates. So uh, we have also the possibility as a live stream panel discussion to collect uh, the uh, questions and comments of uh, the participants herein, of our viewers. So as an information for you, I would like to lead your attention to uh, the possibility that the, you can, during our discussion, uh, you can click on uh, two buttons on one question mark and one statement uh, symbol for posing questions which we will collect and uh, uh, we'll uh, give them answers to them at the end of uh, the panel discussion. So now I would like to introduce our guests. Uh, it's a great honor to have the possibility to, to talk uh, to uh, experts and, and uh, to share their knowledge and their experience within this uh, online panel discussion. I would like to introduce now Florian Bieber, who is a professor and director of the Center for Southeastern European Studies. And uh, he also holds the Jean Monnet Chair in Europeanization of uh, Southeastern Europe at the University of Graz. So, um, 
Many thanks for joining us, Florian. Thank you. Our next guest is Alexandra Vidanovic, who is expert on human rights and independent advisor trainer at the Council of Europe and Olof Palme Center in Belgrade. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much for inviting me. And our third guest is Professor Joran Tiokarevic, uh, who is a uh, professor of comparative politics at the Faculty of Political Science at the University of Belgrade, and uh, who is also guest professor at the College of Europe, Natalin Campus uh, in Warsaw. So, hello, and uh, it's nice to have you here. So, a little bit takes time. Because I would like then uh, to go uh, further with uh, the questions uh, to our guests uh, from third perspective. So hello and thank you for joining us. So Professor Teokarevic, uh, I would like to start uh, with the questions uh, regarding uh, the political context and and uh, the all in all situation. So it's it's uh, it's a deep polarized situation, also deepened uh, by the. COVID-19 uh, pandemic and necessary regulations. And we have uh, the uh, census lowered to 3%. We have uh, an uh, election boycott, which is indeed not the first time in, in um, the uh, Serbian history. So also during the Milosevic regime in the 1990s, uh, oppositional parties called for election boycott, but uh, they never succeeded in that. Uh, and. Uh, what what is your um, perception and and uh, point of view regarding uh, the election boycott uh, at the moment and also uh, against the background of uh, the constitutional framework? Uh, yes, uh, electoral boycott is a very <clears throat> uh, constant topic in in the Balkans. So it has not happened only in Serbia many times but also in Albania, in Montenegro, and in North Macedonia. And it hasn't been very helpful, in fact, uh, in promoting uh, democracy and, and uh, civil rights uh, across the region. Um, in addition to that, one has to say that uh, there is a constant tendency uh, among uh, Serbian voters to vote for the ruling parties which is a, a very strange situation and it has worked in most cases, but I would not make <clears throat> it a rule uh, because there are two main exceptions uh, in that regard. And these are elections in, uh, in the year 2000 when Milosevic was ousted and also 2012 uh, when Serbia got uh, both the president uh, Nikolic from the Serbian Progressive Party and the Serbian uh, government majority in the parliament uh, of uh, the same party. So, uh, historically speaking, so this is a, a rule with important uh, exceptions. What seems to be uh, uh, good for for the uh, for the success of of uh, the change of the attitude to vote for ruling parties is actually that. Uh, we, we need to have an exceptional emergency situation in Serbia, like in 2000, after the, the war with NATO, or as in 2012, where we, uh, in contrast, had a, an almost complete uh, disillusionment and disappointment with the Serbian democratic opposition uh, in government since for, for 12 years uh, almost. Plus, uh, the economic crisis was, was very hard. And these two factors, I think, contributed to the change of the pattern. So the voters vote, did not vote again for the ruling parties. But in order for this um, uh, system to, to, continue, to, to, to continue functioning, actually, it's very important, actually, to see what is at the basis of the type of governance uh, in Serbia. And it is, uh, this is very important for the moment in which we are speaking. Serbian uh, regime is, among other things, uh, a clientelistic, highly clientelistic regime. So in other words, we have asymmetric relationship between those in power and those who are not. 
uh, in which practically uh, goods, there is a, a demand for exchange of goods and services uh, for political uh, support. What is interesting and very important to understand actually, that in countries like Serbia, so not only in Serbia, uh, the clientelism, clientelism actually works on the assumption, which is true, that it is good both for very poor people and for very rich people. When it comes to very rich people, uh, say it is good for them actually to uh, make profitable contracts with public state entities. And I could mention a very uh, illustrative uh, example that we heard for the first time about during the Corona crisis. And that is the, uh, the brother of, of the incumbent justice minister in the Serbian government. And at the same time, sorry, the, the husband of the justice minister and the brother of very popular epidemiologist who has been, is still a, a member of this crisis health uh, team uh, in Serbia. This man with his companies uh, has been able to acquire uh, near 27 million euros in contracts with the state public entities in Serbia during the last five years. When it comes to the second group, much larger group of people uh, that function and that oil this clientelistic machine, the poor and very poor people actually, clientelism is good for them because uh, they can demand some uh, simple uh, economic uh, favors, uh, like uh, the distribution of those infamous 100 euros to all adults in Serbia on the eve of elections after the Corona crisis. And much more importantly, uh, the poor people uh, need jobs. And the only employer in Serbia at the moment is practically the state. Or we can say it more uh, correctly, it's Vucic and his people and his subordinates in, in both public state and private uh, entities in Serbia. So. Uh, Poor people and unemployed people, there's quite a lot of them, although the official unemployment rate is now below 10%, which is not true at all. Um, they are dependent practically on getting a job, finding a job. Uh, and, and this is where the, the state or the, the master, the owner of the state steps in. This is how the, the system works. So it's it's not uh, traditionally an, an antagonism mm -hmm. in between uh, ruralism and urbanism, but it's just an existential uh, problem. And uh, also, uh, when I follow you, uh, this uh, culture of poverty uh, due to um, existential problems. And uh, when we take a look at, at um, the last developments of the last years, uh, after the regime change, after the regime change and the fall of the Milosevic regime in 2000, uh, the October 5 was a very symbolic date. And in 2001, uh, it was often uh, discussed uh, that um, the October 6 uh, did not happen. To what extent uh, did that means uh, a regime change has taken place, but not a system change? And to what extent uh, uh, Professor Teokarevic, uh, do you see um, that as a, as a basis for, for current developments? Because uh, following you, it, 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 uh, it appears that, that there was no um, democratic uh, government in, 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 in the first years, but it, it was uh, indeed until 2008, and then it changed, uh, um, or 2012 to be exact. Uh, and and uh, what... How, how can be that interpreted? Because uh, this, this uh, means that uh, the current um, situation is cemented and not due to uh, historical backgrounds, but also to uh, the culture of poverty. Yes, the, the so-called October 6th phenomenon, or in other words, getting away with the ancien regime, it had many powerful enemies who, as we see today, have eventually won the battle against the October 6th or against the getting away uh, with the ancien regime. Some of the most powerful enemies of this trend, 
or this expectation uh, were the, the following. First, disunity. First, when we look at the opposition, we have had constant disunity within the opposition and also the lack of a more or less unified platform for transforming Serbia towards a liberal uh, democracy and quite a, a high degree of nationalism uh, within the opposition. Uh, also, we, uh, we could uh, quote here a uh, very uh, poor uh, record uh, uh, of a fight against corruption uh, during the, the reign of the democratic opposition in Serbia between the years 2000 and, and 2012. And also, uh, the uh, inability to find solutions uh, for big questions, the economic crisis and, and, uh, and Kosovo. So that all led to, uh, to the, uh, uh, if you want, uh, there's another phenomenon which is interesting and important in my view, and that is uh, as long as the, as the number uh, of, of the so-called transition losers went up, they turned actually their attention and their preferences towards nationalistic policies. That became in a way dominant after the 2012 change of government in, in, uh, in Serbia. And that was also followed uh, by <coughs> uh, negation of war crimes, uh, glorifying uh, those who, uh, who uh, did uh, the, the war crimes uh, during the 90s, and also, uh, it went along with the worsening of relations with all Serbia's, almost all Serbia's uh, neighbors. So this is how actually uh, uh, the, uh, the October 6th never happened. Unfortunately, uh, the uh, part of the opposition that we could label democratic opposition, it suffers from more or less the same illnesses as the governing party or the governing coalition in Serbia. So that was not a change, that was not a power for change uh, also. So thank you. Uh, my next question goes to Alexandra Asha uh, Vidanovic uh, regarding the election boycott. So uh, we have this polarized situation uh, in, in Serbia and, and now uh, the question if uh, the elections uh, will be um, uh, unaccepted due to uh, too low turn voter turnout. And um, when we think about uh, our political education, uh, we have uh, human rights, of course, and uh, hopefully and, and fortunately, and our civic uh, right to vote, and uh, which is at the same time a civil um, responsibility. And how can it be uh, legitimized and, and also explained that uh, people actively uh, refuse to go uh, to the polls. Thank you, Sylvia. Well, uh, as it is our right and responsibility to vote, it's also our right to deny uh, the elections, participation in the elections that we find that are not democratic enough. And that then they don't satisfy, uh, let's say, basic rules of human um, dignity uh and safety because these elections in the times of pandemic are definitely not safe first and foremost uh it is the whole campaign has not been safe um especially uh this huge numbers of people that are gathering for the rallies uh which are not called political but they are political in it safe in itself and um going to the elections which are um which don't guarantee uh, your basic uh, health safety protocols uh, is not good. I mean, this, let's going let's go from this first and basic level. Uh, second thing is that um, actually um, these elections are not really a choice. Where you go to the elections when you have a choice. What uh, is offered in these elections? Um, it's actually. Um, our ruling party and our president uh, choosing his own opposition. You know, that that's uh, it sounds funny, but uh, uh, all those who are going out um, at the parties uh, 
uh, that are going out in elections uh, are going to enter the parliament with this minimum uh, 3%. Uh, and actually, you announced that uh, Sergei Trifunovic and the movement of free citizens is boycotting. No, they're going out as well. So, um, yes, uh, they're one of the parties that... Uh, that will go out on the election. So basically, uh, people will choose a very tokenistic uh, opposition, which will sit in the parliament. So we will just see the same faces that we've been seeing, looking at since the 90s. So we have the mother party, mother load party of the radicals, and their baby party, which outgrew the mother. So it's a Serbian progressive party, which is the ruling party. Then we have the monstrosity from the 90s left over after Milosevic with socialist party, which will again be there. So whether they are going to go into this uh, un unhealthy marriage uh, again with a, a progressive party or not, probably they will. Now they are just doing all this bargaining, uh, what they will get. And then we will have the tokenistic opposition, which is the far right, uh, very scary uh, neo-Nazi party. Um, then we have uh, another far right, uh, which is... Um, um, anti-evolution, uh, anti-abortion, anti-gender uh, rights and everything, another very exotic party which will probably get into the parliament. So we will have a circus. We will actually have opposition nominally, but we will have uh, something that crept out of the stone and in normal democratic society it shouldn't have had the, the possibility. And um, so these uh, elections, in my view and in the view of the huge uh, number of the civil society organizations and people from the uh, civic movements are not legal uh, and are not right. And what Professor Teokarevich was mentioning, like uh, corruption levels. So now we have two uh, very relevant institutions giving reports on the state of human rights and democracy in Serbia. You have Freedom House, which is called calling Serbian regime a hybrid democracy. We're not democracy anymore. And our government sends a complaint letter to Freedom House, which is independent organization, which did this research, um, complaining, no, we are really a democracy. You see, we have opposition. You know, that's a, that's a very, now it's very ironical. Everything that is happening is highly ironical. And then you have a Council of Europe, Greco Commission on the Corruption, um, on the state of corruption. So out of 17 parameters that they were measuring on the co corruption, uh, we uh, are partially uh, compliant with 10 and with seven, absolutely not. So uh, corruption is so deeply um, inserted in every atom of this society. I mean, from the lowest grassroots levels, not talk as well, Professor just mentioned, the highly uh, corruption in a very high uh, um, levels in the state so i don't know what to say nothing really to vote for at this moment and um, boycott is the only uh, sane thing that you can do uh in the moment not to cut your uh, hand <laughs> for giving a vote to someone who will just play uh, yeah the state music so and Asha, do you think the boycott has really a chance? Because in, in, in the last uh, years and also the case we can say now, um, opposition parties or movements uh, uh, called for boycott uh, and, and it never it never happened that uh, the turnout uh, was, was too low to accept the election results. And this is the year, uh, as I know, uh, that international observers will not uh, accompany the, the elections. Uh, what is your... Um, so perspective and expectation, Asha, uh, regarding the results. Uh, will, will a boycott uh, still um, lead to a um, uh, too low turnout or will it just um, be that uh, the elections will work? I'm very pessimistic. <laughs> I'm extremely pessimistic. So this election will work, definitely. And the ruling party will still be a ruling party. It's just a matter of finesse who will enter and who will pass this uh, uh, census. There are a few questions here, as I see, like what about the young generation? Younger generation is the most apathetic one. So it's actually, they're the ones that are really looking how to get away from Serbia as soon as possible. And they are not active voters. That's a difference between 90s and now. In the 90s, uh, student uh, organizations and young people uh, led the revolt in a way. So all the protests, 91, 92, 96, 7, uh, 2000, there were young people there. 
uh, but the revolution ate its kids. So the the new kids uh, are possibly uh, are probably going to vote because they will be eaten by the dinosaurs. That's the last night promotional video of the ruling party. So if you don't go out, dinosaurs will eat you. They have absolute incredible marketing. Uh, uh right now for these elections i think they're scared of bo boycott so that's why it's very passive aggressive the campaign is really uh i mean very passive aggressive towards the non-voters or abstinees about the the safety protocols there is another uh, question here no there is no uh, pos possibility to vote um postally or electronically uh even though uh, many would argue we all uh registered our data to get this 100 euros from the government so they have all our data so basically we're all in one base so we're voting even if we're not voting um yeah it's it's not possible to do it and the last question i think it was more for the professor Tokai, which is about clientelism uh yeah the whole country is in a way uh, clientelistic and the whole atmosphere is uh very neoliberal ironically parties that lead us are progressive and socialist they have nothing to do with either of the ideologies but yeah names are just the names some it seems so so thank you ash we will collect uh, the question at the end of, of of our discussion and and also answer them uh together and my next uh, question i would like to address to professor florian Bieber. so on uh, the eu level uh serbia however appears as a good uh, cooperation partner and is an eu candidate state and uh the performance of of Vucic is appear seems to appear to be trustful and also the um uh, also the dialogue uh, among uh, Serbia and, and or Belgrade and then Pristina, so Vucic and, and Hashem Tachi are in, in, in direct contact and, and uh, Donald Tusk, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, wished good luck uh, to uh, uh, Alexander Vucic, with, with, who is with his progressive party also member of the European People's uh, Party. And uh, you reacted, Florian, yesterday to uh, that congratulations and, and, and good wishes. Uh, so I would uh, like to ask you, uh, what is uh, the situation about uh, the uh, EU accession process of, of Serbia and, and also the perception of, uh, of the inner processes in Serbia and uh, also the uh, international importance of that country? Uh, thanks, Sylvia, for, for this question. I mean, I think, first of all, um, I think the enthusiasm in the European Union uh, towards Vucic has waned in comparison to a few years ago. Uh, he didn't get a photo op with Angela Merkel uh, in Berlin like he did last time when he was elected president. Um, it was exactly a week before the elections that he met with Angela Merkel and with Putin. This time he got Lavrov and uh, Tusk, so it's a little bit more Maybe it's the second rate uh, endorsement um, in the European Union. I think there is a rift in, uh, with him, especially because he's been uh, pushing the uh, border changes in regarding to Kosovo, um, which has been a position which has been endorsed by the United States, the Trump administration, particularly the previous now scandal author, uh, Bolton, uh, national security advisor. But this still seems to be the American position. Um, but this is not the position of Germany. So Germany has been for the long time uh, very favorably uh, disposed towards Vucic. And I think this has been a rupture in a certain way in that relationship uh, over the last two years. So it's not unconditional support, which we used to have. But um, yes, the European People's Party, I mean, it's a party which has been supporting and has a, as one of its members, um, um, uh, an autocrat, uh, Viktor Orban in Hungary, um, and uh, has been unfortunately not sufficiently critical towards authoritarian minded uh, member parties. And thus, it's no surprise that uh, also the position towards Vucic is rather uncritical. It's disappointing of Tusk, but he's been making similar statements about his saying, describing uh, Vucic, the most Serb of all Serbs, uh, two years ago, uh, when he was still an EU official, which really makes everybody cringe in Serbia, considering his uh, personal history in the 1990s. I mean, you cannot say that without being uh, ignoring what he, his role in the Radical Party, an extreme nationalist party involved in paramilitary activities and war crimes. You cannot say that without uh, showing some degree of, of disrespect to, to recent history. Um, so, unfortunately, there's not a lot of criticism, um, but it's also not the kind of an, uh, unconditional uh, support. I think the problem which we're seeing is, is that it's really only uh, currently of the major parties 
uh, the ruling SNS and the SPS, which have international kind of uh, affiliations. I mean, all of the opposition parties are not clearly affiliated or strongly affiliated with European party families. Um, the Democratic Party is, but it's kind of now very much subsumed in the uh, boycotting um, a group of parties. Um, it's not very strong anymore. Um, there, are, there are, of course, the far right parties from radicals to dveri. Um, there are uh, parties um, which are otherwise not affiliated. They haven't been building European contact. And I think this is one of the big weakest weaknesses of the opposition in Serbia, besides its internal fragmentation and lack of ideological coherence. It's its lack of international outreach. It's been very, in a certain way, very much self internally centered, and that, of course, becomes um, becomes a boomerang in these situations. Um, when we have boycotts as well, and I think this is important to kind of add to the previous discussion, um, is that generally speaking, this is going to be the worst of all boycotts. Um, and I reminded of the '97 boycotts in Serbia when most of the opposition boycotted, but then some participated. Um, in that case, that back then it was Vuk Drashkovic, who's now running, I believe, on a uh, together with the Progressive Party uh, as a minor add-on, that's in kind of his his uh, career of uh, over the last 30, 25 years. But um, he legitimized the elections in '97, and now again we have too many opposition parties participating to fundamentally undermine the, the 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 elections. And the only one to which you can really undermine the elections is internationally, because domestically there's a polarization. Either people believe the regime or are clientelistically linked to it or they're against it. Um, but it's very much about the international signal. Um, and I think that's not going to succeed because, first of all, international actors have been generally very skeptical about boycotts. Now we can discuss whether that's justified or not. But in previous boycotts, they've been usually kind of talking about constructive dialogue. And the framing has been always about this is about an issue between government and opposition, not about democracy. This has been one of the big weaknesses of international responses. This happened in North Macedonia. This happened in Montenegro and in, in Albania. And I don't think it's going to be very different in Serbia. So I think the boycott cannot achieve what it seeks to achieve in terms of getting international attention, um, especially because parts of the opposition are participating and those who are boycotting don't have the international kind of allies to convince them to say this is a serious problem. You cannot work with Vucic um, for resolving any problems because that's not what he's in business in. He's in the business of making problems and not resolving them. Um, but, but I think this is one of the structural weaknesses. In that sense, I think maybe the failure of the opposition to really undermine the legitimacy of the elections, my prediction, is something which will lead to a learning process of what it has to do different. So just like 97 was learning for 2000, maybe this election in 2020 is learning for uh, the next step of how to eff effectively confront the government. Uh, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. My microphone, sorry, yeah. um, my microphone just to, to listen to you. So what, what uh, you in, in, in fact also uh, ex explained was with the situation that we have uh, the paradoxic situation in Serbia that uh, stabilocracy and the stabilocrat is leading uh, Serbia uh, to uh, Euro European Union. And what is the stabilocracy about? It's uh, the policy and the strategy of uh, pretending uh, that there is uh, security and stability uh, while in fact uh, checks and balances are weakened and uh, the situation is is everything as what well, but uh, liberal democratic and uh, regarding Serbia now we have this contradiction and, and uh, that on the one hand uh, it's it's a success story it, it uh, it's a new candidate and uh, on the European level and on the other hand um, the internal uh, uh, divisions and struggles and uh, and Florian, uh, my question to you: When when there is the situation uh, that um, uh, you men mentioned that uh, oppositional parties do not have any allies, how uh, can can that be realized? Because we have the situation that uh, the opposition is marginalized in in, uh, in public in media in public space. Uh, and what is the way out? Because when we when we refer again uh, to the year. 2000, and you mentioned uh, the elections and the protests of uh, 96 and 7, uh, where 
the lessons learned for the 2000 developments. So what can be now uh, be the factors for, for learning for uh, the uh, upcoming uh, developments? Because there are also uh, experts who have the prognosis uh, that the current government will end uh, in 2020. I don't know uh, against which background, but um, these also are the prognosis that it is not uh, eternal, but uh, just a question of time. At the other hand, uh, when structures are stabilized uh, through uh, institutions, uh, in, in, in a way, eternity can, in a way, uh, be also uh, perceived. Well, first of all, nothing lasts forever. Although if you're in Montenegro, that for not forever can look very long lasting. And I think the Vucic government is aiming for uh, a Dukanovic scenario of staying in power. Um, and I think the problem is that in the European Union itself, there isn't the willingness to use all the mechanisms available. So for example, the accession process has not made much advances in recent years. I mean, the chapters are open, but they're not really closed. Uh, nobody talks about 2025 anymore, so the enlargement process for Serbia is stagnating. But the EU, the Commission, is not willing to use the emergency break. Uh, that is, for example, the imbalance clause, which says the rule of law is in such a discrepancy to other areas that we cannot negotiate with Serbia. Um, and I think the reason why the EU is worried is that Vucic constantly tells them, if you don't dance with us, we go and ask our friend China, Russia, Turkey to dance with us, and they are just as attractive as you are. And this is what you know Vucic said during the pandemic. And the, what is the response of the European Union? It says, no, no, we give you better aid, we give you more aid. Um, so in a certain way, they're playing the game, they are in a certain way falling for its trap um, because China, Russia, Turkey are not offering anything to the citizens beyond a few masks and uh, uh, credits which have to be paid back. Um, and so the EU is in a certain way entrapped um, by Serbia. So it can only change if they realize that this is... Um, that they have to have a different approach, clearer language. I mean, one of the big things which happened after 97 in, uh, with Milosevic was that the international community realized that Milosevic was not the guarantor of stability in the Balkans. This is how it was perceived. Felipe Gonzalez went uh, there to negotiate between opposition and Milosevic in 97. Um, and only the Kosovo War real made the realization clear that Milosevic is not a partner, is not bringing stability. Now, I don't hope and believe in a likelihood of an armed conflict, but some kind of clear uh, realization has to occur in the international community, as far as there's a community, um, that Vucic is not a partner for them. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, my next question goes to, to, to Alexandra, to Asha. Uh, we have the situation of the uh, permanent waiting room regarding the accession. And uh, you mentioned uh, young people who flee the country. So uh, approximately there are 60,000 people who leave Serbia uh, per year. And uh, how is it um, trustful for people uh, living in, in Serbia that after um, a democratic um, party government, after the year 2000, uh, the former opponents, or now again um, intensified opponents, are leading uh, the country to the European Union. So what is uh, the atmosphere regarding a uh, situation uh, that an autocrat uh, regime is leading the country to the European Union and uh, also the perceptions of uh, the European Union itself, because it also seems after nearly 20 years, it, it lost in a way its glance, uh, if, if it might be said. This is a very complex question. Uh, I belong to these generations that lead to the, the changes and uh, I was on the streets during these 90s and 2000s uh, and I can, yeah, I said it before, I think the, the revolution uh, ate its children because the leaders of uh, 90s revolutions, let's say, uh, are now very structurally part of the government in different ways of political parties. So they are there. So we were in our 20s, now we are in our 40s 
or 50s in and actually um if i may use the the term gentrification because what is happening from the wild serbia uh which had the passion and the energy and the uh, mood and it was not perfect but it was moving it was gentrified in every way so uh like um like our belgrade is now uh no more parks only stone <laughs> and modern structures uh so we also became this stone uh, and modern structures uh, nowadays young people have very little energy and uh, willingness uh to become the change that is needed uh from what i know and i've been working with some young people um with lots of young people actually uh their wish is just to be the same as in europe so it's uh, like a, a the, the, the and to go to europe and to be europe but not necessarily getting uh, politically engaged to become this part of the europe they're just looking for jobs so they are even willing to you know do, do the waitressing um in germany um rather than stay here and make changes i know a few young people who studied medicine and decided to go to germany just to be nurses without like even after seven years of studying medicine they accepted a lower paid job just to leave so uh this is very scary uh, i don't know where this um energy can come out uh from i don't know what needs to happen that's a very good and legitimate question i hope we don't need a war <laughs> in order to create this kind of a also to to alert outside uh that we need help uh but uh what is happening right now i don't know which kind of electrical shock is needed for the civil society which is also totally pacified and um Oh, dealing with some very superficial things i uh, organizations big civil society organizations which were very political in its actions uh in the past um just died out or just became very very pacified uh and very obedient uh so um i really don't know what's what's going on there because they got the eu funds and then they have to play the eu role role also foreign embassies are not helping a lot then when you see the US ambassador um, um, dining and whining with the government all the time, uh, it doesn't put much faith in the, the, the any anything that the US can and will do, even though USAID was supporting civil sector before. But then you have half of the uh, civil sector that works for USAID projects sitting in this government, including our prime minister. I mean, so it's a, not really putting faith. And our president supporting President Trump, which is also devastating. Being, I mean, that's not giving a good signal to young people i went out of the question that you asked but uh i honestly i have no uh answer i have no good answer maybe somebody else from the speakers has a good answer to this question uh regarding youth asha thank you we have i would like to include it, uh, this question this uh from from a participant uh from uh julius leiter uh who, who posed the question if if uh, youth organizations and youth participation is uh supported and funded and of course this also leads to the situation of the 1990s because we know that uh, during the 1990s open society and, and USA, USAID uh, could uh, help uh, oppositional developments and the youth and uh, what is the situation because it, it uh, really fits now to, to what you uh, said I would like to include this uh, spontaneously. Youth organization there is a very uh, a very supportive ministry of youth um, uh, which is giving lots of grants, um, especially to the mysterious youth organizations that are uh, leading and inviting people in the middle of pandemic to uh, burn torches on the buildings uh, and invite people to protest against the uh, hunger strikers, for example. Uh, I'm being very ironical, but there are lots of state-funded youth organizations lots of and even some uh, very decent youth organizations since they lack the funds they have they accept the funds from the uh from the ministry and from, from the government and are very passive they are dealing with superficial things that's what i was saying they are not dealing with crucial important issues and they are not not getting politicized they are avoiding politics anything that smells like politics that's my impression so they deal with social entrepreneurship um uh, care uh, for um, elderly, uh, lots of night environment, lots of important things, but not anything that would be uh, 
uh, crucial. There are EU funds, they're mainly for the EU exchanges and you know, cross-border exchanges, also very relevant, very important, and very hard, uh, hard to access. Um, if you are not a well-structured organization with big budget and expertise to apply for EU funds. Uh, other donors, I would, there are very few. Uh, I work a lot and mostly, I mean, with the Palma Center, all of Palma Center, which supports social democratic initiatives and trade unions. That's the main part of my job, but it's the same situation with the, uh, with it. There are not too many civil society organizations with the potential to make uh, any constructive changes. That's that's my opinion. Yeah. Thank you, Asha. Uh, I would like to pose my next question to Professor Teokarevich, uh, because uh, we have uh, the situation of, of, of um, depopulation, or if we may say that, um, many people leaving the country and uh, also um, uh, prognosis and, and, and interpretations to what extent uh, this uh, might influence uh, the political culture in, uh, in the future. And I would like, uh, in a way, it may, it may uh, sound a little bit provoking, uh, Professor Teokarevich, uh, to what extent do you see also the current uh, development, so brain drain and, and, and uh, my Im uh, immigration, um, emigration, sorry, emigration, getting out, exit. Uh, what what uh, do you see which which influence do, might it have for the future because uh, democ democracy and demography are interlinked really strongly interlinked uh, high levels of immigration have of course detrimental effects on all spheres on economy on society and on politics also and as has been debated uh, during the last months very much in, in the literature and in media, you see practically the tendency in, in post-communist societies, including Serbia, that the main possible potential forces for liberal democracy um, have been actually exited, have been emigrating. And this reduces uh, the, the core part of, of society, actually, that could be a motor of change. And uh, in, in this respect, Serbia is, is not different than the others. Bulgaria will have a much more dramatic uh, population decline. Uh, so this is a, a very dangerous trend. But if I may add now, because we are probably at the end of the conversation, um, I, I would like to, to add two brief things. One is, I believe all, your, all our listeners actually are knowledgeable because they are interested in, in participating in this debate. They are quite knowledgeable about uh, Serbia. But let me stress two things. One is the level of domination of Vucic and his party in Serbia. It is an extraordinary level. So with the uh, uh, last electoral results of 48% win for the uh, parliament of Serbia, to which one might add 11% of his partner, uh, Socialist Party of Serbia, he practically runs the, car, uh, the, the country alone, fueling, this, this, is, this has been fueled by the cult of personality that has been built. So uh, he practically out beyond any institution that formerly still exists in Serbia, he controls both parliaments in Serbia and both governments of Serbia and of Vojvodina. And out of 159 municipalities, there are only three that he is that where his party is not in control. One in Belgrade, but that's one of 17 municipalities in Belgrade, and two in provinces in Shabats and in Paracin. He controls practically all media except for a couple of TV stations, two weeklies and one daily, and a couple of websites. So all this with less than 50% uh, majority in the, in the assembly. Uh, one can, so what are the, uh, how to say, the, the prospects uh, after these elections? Uh, everybody's guessing now how, how high the boycott will be, how successful. I guess uh, it's going to be certainly, uh, so the turnout is going to be certainly less than 50%, but not less than 40%, which is not enough. One uh, comparing example, exactly a year ago, 
there was there were uh, uh, local elections in Albania, and we have not said that now. We have on the same date in in three days, we have also local elections in Serbia. The turnout there was only 21%. So the opposition was extremely successful, actually, in boycotting uh, these elections. Nothing happened. And the EU and other uh, powerful international actors practically, you know, turned a blind eye. They, they issued some recommendations, some criticism, but they practically legitimized these elections in Albania. If that was done with 21%, what can we expect with 40 plus percent that I predict in Serbia? I'll stop here. I don't want to mention the second thing. Thank you. We have time. We have time. Thank you. We have time. Uh, Jovan, okay. uh, can, can I add something? One more. Please, One please. More. We have time. Yes, that, that I think it, it's very important. So uh, Florian was speaking about that. I will just want to, to continue the, the story. What the, what the Serbian democratic opposition hasn't been, hasn't achieved, hasn't been successful at, is the internationalization of the de democratic crisis in, in Serbia. One thing that its counterpart, the Macedonian democratic opposition, actually was successful at five years ago. And that is a huge difference. So in that year, in, in Macedonia, actually, the EU reacted positively and set, sent an envoy, and practically he wrote this uh, famous Priber report, and practically uh, what was introduced was a real effective mediation between the government and the opposition. What we had in Serbia during the, the last part of, of the last year is actually uh, some kind of a substitute of real uh, mediation between, uh, between the two sides. And I'm sure that... Uh, Whatever the results and the turnout on Sunday will be, uh, well, the result will be the same as in Albania in June 2019. There will be some criticism and some recommendations, but practically from the international point of view, these fraud elections will be not will be considered not only uh, legit uh, uh, in 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 harmony with the law but also to a high degree as legitimate. And that will make the things in Serbia much worse. Uh, things might not change with the coming uh, post-corona economic crisis in autumn or in, or in, in, in uh, winter. So what has prevailed in this discussion is actually a very high degree of pessimism that we all share, it seems. And it is actually... Uh, it actually describes Serbia very well. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Teokarovic. Uh, there was a question by one participant uh, regarding clientelism, which would uh, also fit to your uh, explanations. And uh, it, it's uh, again from uh, Google Saita, uh, who asked, can, uh, can you, uh, um, so can you um, see, um, uh, can you still call it clientelism if it excludes uh, most parts of the population? So, so I can uh, put it uh, just to. Uh, uh, so it's it, it's not working. It's a thought, but can you call it uh, still uh, in clientelism if uh, most parts of the population is included by that? So it's a, a good, interesting question. So when uh, ends clientelism and where does it start? Yeah, it's a proper question. Yes. It includes, it involves uh, big parts of the, of, the, of the population, but mostly, as I said, those who are poor and in search of jobs on one side, and those who are very rich and well connected uh, with the uh, with the governing uh, people. So I think yes, uh, this description uh, of of Serbia, of the governance in Serbia, is still uh, actually good uh, for for that. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. And, and my next question goes to uh, Florian, Professor Florian Bieber. Uh, you mentioned, uh, previously you mentioned uh, that uh, it's, it's not uh, realized on European level uh, in, a, in, a, in a political processes. And, 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 and also, uh, Jovan Piokaric also mentioned uh, the democratic crisis. And uh, all in all, we could uh, 
we could maybe you know, so in a provoking way we could we could say uh, we do not have at the moment a uh, corona crisis but also a democracy crisis which started before the corona crisis and then is now increasing uh, due to these uh, factors and uh, on the european level uh, which, uh, which allies, uh, apart from the European People's Party, uh, the Serbian government uh, can expect. And here I would also like to include uh, also the uh, question on why uh, is the EPP actually supporting uh, the, I'm not, not trying, uh, because it's a longer question and uh, it, it should be seen now. No. Uh, so why the European People's Party, you know, Florian, uh, is including and then what is the, the, the relationship uh, also in that context uh, mm. with the uh, Polish peace government and uh, the European government in, in Hungary, which you also mentioned uh, in your statement uh, regarding the uh, issues to Alexander Vucic. Mm. I, I want to pick up on, um, use that to also pick up on something which Jovan said, the difference to the Macedonian situation um, uh, a few years ago. I mean, I think one thing was happened is that in Macedonia, North Macedonia, back then still Macedonia, um, in 2016, there was a clear opposition party, which was part of the socialist member party family. So it had allies in Europe and was able to mobilize them and it was able to mobilize citizens. And that all made it a lot easier for the European Union to become active. None of this is currently in place uh, in Serbia. Also, I think this is important to mention, who was the commissioner in charge of enlargement uh, four years ago? It was uh, Johannes uh, uh, Hahn, who was uh, the Austrian commissioner who uh, became involved. Uh, who is the commissioner now? It's the Hungarian commissioner who was a close loyalist of Viktor Orban. So I think you know, I don't know what happened, but it's no, to, to me, it's an interesting coincidence that I was part of a discussion yesterday where this was pointed out by, um, by some of the speakers about Hungarians' influence in the Western Balkans, that uh, Viktor Orban visits uh, President Vucic and the three, a few days later, the Commissioner for Enlargement announces that there will be no progress reports, no reports uh, of the Commission uh, for the Western Balkans until the fall. Let's just say it's very convenient uh, for the for the uh, government of Serbia not to have a critical report about uh, the lack of progress uh, in EU enlargement come out a few days or weeks before the elections. So you know, it's very clear that the Orban government has been supporting uh, the government of Alexander Vucic. It's been supporting um, the government of Nikola Gruevski, uh, and it has um, their ma inside man in the European Commission to help them. Um, and I think this is, we have to be aware of this particular uh, risk. Um, the problem is, why does the EPP support it? I mean, the problem is the EPP is, of course, a heterogeneous uh, group of actors. Orban likes to produce uh, his, you know, people who think and rule similarly to him. Uh, he's been promoting it in Macedonia. He's promoting it currently in Slovenia with Yanis Jansha, who was also copying uh, a combination of Orban and Trumpist rhetoric uh, in his attacks on the media and the opposition. Um, and he's doing it in the case of Serbia. So Orban has a, an interest. Also, he wants these kind of governments in the European Union because it strengthens his uh, bargaining tool within uh, the EU. Um, the, Motivation is more tricky when it comes to uh, conservative parties elsewhere in Europe, especially the German CDU or the EVP in Austria, where I'm not entirely sure what the motivation is. With Hungary, it's clear these are votes in the European Parliament. They translate into commissioners. They translate into majorities in the Parliament. Uh, I'm never sure what it is with the SNS or other parties. I think it is, of course, about power. It's you know many European people, European party families are about power, and uh, you know we shouldn't exclude the socialists from this critique because they've been equally uncritical when it comes to Edi Rama in Albania or Milo Djukanovic in Montenegro. So it's not in a sort of way only one party family. But I think what we're seeing is that what people said 10 years ago, the European party families will quote unquote Europeanize these parties, will make them more European, more uh, in, a certain way, in line with larger European dynamics. It's in fact the opposite. I think these autocrats have undermined these parties and have in a certain way, um, it's the, you know, what I call often, it's you know, the, the old metaphor of the tail wagging the dog, not the other way around. And that's what we're seeing is that these autocrats are you know kind of wagging the dog of european party families and really undermining them um, but um, unfortunately we don't because basically 
uh, a voter in Germany will not like if the CDU cooperates with the far right AfD, um, and they will punish the party if it wants to do that. But if the same party cooperates with the Fides, which is ideologically no different from the AfD in Germany, um, then this is forgiven because nobody pays attention. So the German voter doesn't pay attention. The Austrian voter doesn't pay attention to who the allies are in Macedonia and Serbia. And I think this allows a much more pragmatic uh, poli power politics game rather than one based on values and norms. We don't hear you. So it's always the intention not to, to disturb, but uh, then. Uh, uh, thank you, Florian. I would like to include uh, the question of of, of Christina uh, Giesler because uh, it uh, it also fits uh, uh, what you mentioned, uh, how the Serbian election observed uh, observed by the neighboring countries uh, and what impact can uh, can it have on on the neighborhood. Well, I'll say that it's showing what is possible um, in terms of what, what we've had earlier, a complete uh, sidelining of opposition, media control, clientelism, um, kind of this consolidation and holding election in this context. If you get away with it, then this is certainly a very useful lesson for uh, those who like to govern in similar ways. Uh, it shows them what they can do. Um, so in that sense, I think it's a negative signal. Uh, we don't have immediate candidates. I mean, Milo Djokanovic is ruling similarly, and he's been doing it for a long time, and that's not going to change because of what he's learned. He, he's teaching Vucic, is that learning from Vucic particularly. But it certainly kind of sets a pattern for the region, uh, which is rather negative and kind of shows it's like pushing the boundaries. I mean, Orban has been professionalizing this, is pushing the red lines, crossing them to see as much as possible uh, how much he can get away with. And this is what Vucic is doing with these elections now. Um, and if there's no pushback, at least internationally, then I, then I worry that it will be encouraging for others. So we have also, I uh, think we have a completely different uh, situation than in the zero years, 2000 years. Uh, when uh, European, uh, on the European uh, Union level, uh, the Serbian government under the under the Democratic Party was pushed put much more under pressure. And uh, Florian, you mentioned uh, due to the uh, geopolitical influence uh, by uh, China and Russia, uh, it's it's now the um, the need uh, to to be uh, more active. Uh, and uh, what? Um, uh, what what is is, is your uh, recommendation, Flor uh, Florian? You mentioned uh, that uh, oppositional parties should uh, search for for allies, and at the same time, uh, there should be uh, the sensitivity and perception that um, new relationships uh, should be necessary. But uh, also provoking, wouldn't that uh, destabilize uh, the current situation? I mean, I, I would say that first things have to get worse before they get better, unfortunately. And I'm not saying this because I wish it, but it seems uh, the kind of breaking point also where citizens are, because I mean, in a certain way, as Jovan has said, this is a clientelistic system. Lots of people are tied uh, to the system. They have to vote for the ruling party because they might lose their job. They have to deliver votes. This is, these systems only break if people are willing to take a high risk to vote against it. Um, otherwise, there's a high price they pay. They have to have a certain degree of certainty uh, that their rebelling against the system will be successful because if they lose, they pay a price for it, um, a personal price, uh, because they're clientelistically linked to the, to the government. Um, and uh, or they have to feel like they have nothing to lose. None of this has been reached at this point. Um, and so, so this makes this makes this kind of breakthrough uh, a, a lot a lot more difficult. But I think you know the last point, and I mean, is also that you know the, the, the opposition is ideologically so heterogeneous. You know, you have Dveri, which is basically not just an extreme nationalist, but you know has has you know far right. Uh, you know, talks about population exchange. I mean, it's it's on the it's copies. You know, com combines far right Serbian nationalism with the kind of you know AfD. Um, uh, FPÖ, far right politics of Europe, um, you know, and they are together with uh, with liberals and with then kind of conservatives who are kind of ambiguous. Um, the, you know, it's very hard with this kind of 
a hodgepodge of ideas. They're not pro-European. Uh, many of them are anti-European in many ways. Um, th their, their ideas are very contradictory. So it's very easy for us for the government to attack them. And of course, the government is also everything. Vucic is also both, you know, appeals to fascists and to pro-Europeans in a whole spectrum. Uh, and the opposition does the same. So the question is, why vote for the bad copy if we can get the original who covers everything? And so I think it's very hard for the opposition to work if it doesn't have a clear alternative. What does it offer? Does it offer 10 Vucic's to replace one Vucic? I mean, 10 little guys who are very similar in personality, uh, in ideas than he is. Why should you support that? And I think this is this is the problem. There isn't a clear, in a certain way, uh, offer on the table, which really suggests that, of course, it's very hard because the European Union doesn't make it easy. In 2000, you could say, we want not wars, we don't want uh, a kind of isolation, we don't want sanctions, we don't want um, the kind, of, we want a European future of Serbia. Now, now this is what Vucic is saying. So how can you want a more European future for Serbia. Um, so this is, I think, very difficult, but it's certainly one of the structural weaknesses of the current power constellation. Uh, thank you. I would like to lead this question to Alexandra. So um, what what to do if one Vucic or, or as Florian mentioned, uh, or 10 ones? So it's, it's also a question uh, regarding uh, civil society uh, activities. I believe that civil society would like to wait it out a bit because, I mean, one Vucic is quite enough. So I don't know what we would be able, whether, whether we would be able to deal with one and a half Vucic. And already uh, lots of the other politicians are little clones of Vucic by their rhetorics and behavior. So, um, and also just go back for a second to uh, to the neighboring countries. We also have elections incoming in Croatia and Macedonia, and we will see actually what the impact is. So they dared uh, as well in the midst of pandemic uh, to play the same card. So I'm very curious to see what's going on there. So I already am following a bit uh, the mess that is being created and stronger and stronger uh, right-wing uh, rhetorics and politics of uh, xenophobia, uh, virusophobia, you know, it all, all also uh, stimulated this general fear where you are very, it's very easy uh, to manipulate with uh, people who are in panic. Um, uh, I believe that not only 21st, we won't bring much, many changes, but I believe that possibly 27th and 28th, the vid of the thing, which somebody uh, smartly called it uh, today COVID done, so not vid of them, will bring some changes with the talks of Vucic and Tarci about Kosovo. So I believe that might be very interesting because they're going to Washington to talk about Kosovo. So for me, I'm expecting some news which might shake uh, this uh, Dead Sea that we uh, currently have, where we're all kind of trying to swim, uh, but we can't even sink. That's really, the, it, it is, a, I believe, for me, the good analogy, because you can't properly swim in this sea, but you can't even properly sink. So you're just there floating and waiting for something to happen. So, mm -hmm. yeah, thank you. Thank you. And and uh, next question, uh, I would like to pose to, to Jovan Teokarevic. Uh, would, would you expect, uh, after these uh, elections, uh, from the inner uh, point of view of Serbia, regarding the EU accession process and, and what and the leg legitimacy of the new government uh, regarding uh, final EU, EU accession process? It's going to be more of the same, I think. Uh, so one step forward, two steps back a very long uh, way ahead of us um, in uncertain future. Uh, it, it, nothing different, actually, from uh, than, than what we have had. Um, the EU is also inconsistent, uh, as Florian was uh, saying, uh, in this because, uh, for instance, they, at the end of March, on, on March the 30th, uh, they decided uh, to open negotiations with the North Macedonia <clears throat> and Albania. And until now, this was expected or is expecting to, to, to happen in June. There is no date for the start of these accession negotiations. Uh, by and large, we can say the same thing is happening about uh, two methods, two ways 
of going towards EU membership. Um, the uh, two states, Montenegro and Serbia, which have been negotiating for several years now, uh, have not actually chosen uh, the model, the, the old one or the new one proposed uh, by the European Commission earlier in the year. So we have so many unknown things. And I think uh, if the EU enlargement has been sidelined and marginalized during the last 10 or, or 12 years, uh, the situation is not going to change. It might get actually even, even worse now after this pandemic, and it's going to be even further on the margins of interest uh, of the EU. So uh, not a big change, uh, I would say. Thank you. And uh, Lauren Bieber, um, I would uh, like um, now uh, last round. Uh, I would like to start uh, with uh, Florian Bieber. Uh, what effect um, does it have uh, that, uh, that um, from the geopolitical point of view, that uh, Serbia is surrounded by uh, NATO members uh, and uh, NATO accession and membership uh, is also kind of, for the perceived at least, uh, is a kind of guarantee uh, for EU accession. And of course, um, uh, a NATO accession of Serbia first of all after 1999. Um, it does not seem to be possible. Well, I, I you know, I think uh, while there's a link between NATO and EU accession, it's not a must. And I think uh, I would, I would be very skeptical that any country has to join NATO to join the European Union. Um, the countries who've joined NATO um, in recent years have done so because they see it as a security provision. I don't think for Serbia it's it's on the agenda. I mean. So in that sense, I think EU accession is not going to fail because of lack of NATO membership. I mean, I think that's that's not what is what is going to jeopardize Serbia's NATO uh, EU accession process. I think NATO, Serbia has been quite clear on that that it doesn't want to join NATO. Um, you know, in that sense, it's also surrounded by NATO member states in many ways. So um, one has to also be careful not to not to in a certain way uh, overplay the kind of argument of the Russian threat and the Russian involvement. I mean, you can't fly a Russian plane to Serbia without crossing NATO airspace these days. So, I mean, there's a limit of, of what that role can do in a security dimension. Um, but I think one thing is interesting is if you look at the number of Serbian citizens who are in favor of joining NATO, that number has declined dramatically over the last 10 years. I mean, uh, you know, in the early 2010s, there was not a majority, it never was, but there was a much larger number of people in Serbia in favor of NATO membership than there are today. And that's very ironic because it's not that NATO did anything against Serbia in the meantime, um, um, because you know the big issue was 1999. You would expect that wartime passes, it would become less important, but the opposite has happened. It's the same thing when you ask, do Serbs care about Kosovo? A lot fewer Serbs cared about Kosovo 10 years ago than they do now, which to me suggests that this is not an accident. This is the government constantly talking, A, about NATO threat. Um, if you look at Former and all the media, constantly talking about NATO being hostile, aggressive. You have a Minister of Defense who's making his main kind of political capital out of bashing NATO and the West. Um, and at the same time, also talking about Kosovo. So I think you have to look a lot about how the government is manufacturing public opinion and what that tells us about what it intends to do. So it's not preparing the ground for Kosovo. It's certainly not preparing the ground for, for closer, not membership, but alliance or cooperation with NATO. And all of that is in a certain way deliberately uh, done by the government through its, in a certain way, public relations and media control. We don't hear you. Thank you, Florian. Uh, I'm just looking. Uh, we do not have uh, some questions, and I would like uh, to finalize uh, with the last questions, uh, which is in a way is summarizing. So we have uh, broad pessimism uh, in 90 uh, minutes collected, uh, but um, we have the context of. Uh, post-corona, corona, corona uh, global uh, crisis situation and um, um, threatening uh, liberal democracy. Uh, and uh, from the personal point of view, uh, kind of uh, provoking question, what do you personally expect after um, um, Sunday, on coming Monday? 
So I would like to start with you, Florian, and then we go then to, to Asha and, and, and you want to acknowledge. I mean, I think I've been clear saying that things will not get better. And I fear that the elections will confirm the absolute dominance. And um, I would also agree with Alexandra's point that the regime is picking his opposition rather than the other way around. So I expect things to get worse um, in the coming months, stagnation with the EU, uh, internal kind of frustration. That, that can be a productive dimension in de developing new ideas and new energy of how to tackle um, this kind of embedded, entrenched regime. But I don't see a change soon. I don't believe anything will happen on Vidov or COVID done um, beyond a nice photo and a few tweets and that will all disappear like the Israeli Palestinian peace plan uh, and the uh, North Korean rapprochement. Uh, all of this is just uh, smokes and mirrors. Mm, and Asha, what are you expecting? Uh, I was hoping for this COVID done to bring some change because the elections definitely won't and things will get worse before they get better. I absolutely agree. They will get much, much worse, I'm afraid. So, um, yeah, um, I mean, if we had some shreds of dignity and democracy now, I think we will have to fight really hard uh, to keep them. I'm really very, very pessimistic, uh, unfortunately. I kind of lost faith in the civil society and the only faith I potentially have is in these grassroots uh, civic movements like Nedavimo Beograd, the local Nefront uh, uh, Association of Tenants in Niche. So it's on the local level. Hopefully by 2022 they will get stronger enough or more people will recognize the potential. Otherwise, I really I'm, I'm very scared to say yeah, not a good week in front of us. And you want to tell what what, uh, what is your personal expectation? I share the, the pessimistic view of both of our uh, <clears throat> participants and actually think that uh, more than other things, external influence or something else, actually the economic situation might be the key to... Uh, what we are speaking about, not perhaps to the change. And in that respect, uh, I'm, how to say, not, uh, not brave enough to say that uh, the, the drive for change the, uh, could actually come only with the worsening of the economic situation. And I don't wish that for my country and for the society. Uh, and we are not there at this moment, in fact, because uh, despite uh, mountains of lies that we have been hearing uh, from Vucic about economic successes, uh, the economic uh, situation is better to some extent now than several years ago uh, in many ways. And uh, it's not going actually because we have and we shall have actually quite high level of foreign investment. Uh, heavily subsidized by Vucic's budget, uh, we won't have a dramatic fall uh, of economic activity, especially because Serbia does not depend on, on uh, money from tourism as some other Southeast European countries and other countries in Europe uh, depend. So it's uh, going to be muddling through uh, the economic crisis uh, and uh, this uh, reduces the chances for revolt uh, in, in Serbia. All those who are uh, unsatisfied or angered by the type of regime they live in, and I am there, uh, and if they're younger than me, they will find actually liberal democracy somewhere else, not in Serbia. So many thanks for your prospects and, and prospects to liberal democracy and, and uh, what we can expect from uh, the elections on coming Sunday. Uh, at that point, I would like to thank all our guests uh, for this deep insight and, and uh, sound analysis. Um,
Thank you, uh, Florian. Thank you, Asha. And uh, thank you, Jovan, for participating and uh, joining us here. And, thank you. Uh, thank you. And uh, at the same time, I would like uh, to lead uh, the attention uh, to the uh, coming um, panel discussion on uh, the election of in Croatia. It will take place uh, also online as a live stream panel discussion on the 2nd of July, because uh, the Croatian parliamentary elections will take place on Sunday, the 5th of July. And uh, we will uh, uh, spread more information uh, in cooperation with uh, the Political Academy and the uh, Renner Institute. So just uh, follow our website and also social media um, info and, and, and information. And all to our all viewers, uh, thank you for watching and, and following. Uh, and uh, there is not 